So at this point, we need to unmute ourselves, everybody, unless we find a way. Okay. There we go. We are recording. Okay. So let me just introduce you to Laura Pollock, whom I had the great pleasure to take a workshop with this winter in February uh, before we all got shut down. Um, I'm really excited to, to have Laura doing this demo for us. She's one of our up and coming artists. Uh, she recently became a, um, entered the master circle of IAPS. So she's gotten international recognition, which is quite exciting. A little bit about her background. Um, she attended Michigan State University where um, she has obtained her master's degree and then she attended the Center for Creative Studies and, and did postgraduate work at the Center for Creative Studies in Detroit. She worked in advertising for over 20 years and during that time she had her own ad agency. She now lives in Greensboro, North Carolina and winters in Florida. And she has achieved signature status with Pastel Society of America and also the, the societies of West Coast, Southeast, and North Carolina. And as I recently said, um, as I just said, she um, obtained a master circle of IAPS. Mm -hmm. So I think that's it. Anything else that I should say, Laura? No, we're good. We're good. Okay, so now... I'm going to switch to active speaker. Okay, so I get to take now, it away, you, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want us to mute ourselves and then unmute ourselves if we have a question? That's a good idea because let's say a kitty or a kid or a husband comes by, then everybody hears it. You may not want that, and it can be a little bit distracting. So yeah, right. keep yourselves muted, but feel free to pipe in. I really like that because. I want to know that I'm not putting you all to sleep, which is really important. Pamela, I'm glad to see that you made it on. I saw your request for the link. And so many of you I know, and I'm very thrilled to be here. I want to thank Margaret very, very much for the connection. And uh, Michal, thank you. And Anita, we've, we've spent some long hours having long discussions at IAPS that were just mm -hmm. great fun. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's wonderful to see so many uh, names that I know but haven't really met and can't wait till we can actually hug because this is really a crazy time. But thank goodness for Zoom because otherwise we wouldn't even get this much. No, so what I'm gonna do um, is I'm gonna share my screen. And can you let, mute everyone or everyone should mute themselves? Actually, I can probably do that. Let me go back. And Could somebody put the passcode in the chat box for me? I'd like to get on this on my iPad and I, I don't have it. If that's possible. Um, anybody should be able to do that, right? Yeah. Yes. If somebody could do that, I'd appreciate it. I can it. do it. I'll do it. I just have to. Um, uh, One thing that I would love you all to do when you do unmute and you do want to ask a question, which I really encourage, is to say, hi, this is Laura. Um, I have a question, or your, your first and last name, because um, there's so many little boxes, it takes a while to find the moving lips, and I can't really tell who's talking. <laughs> So I'm going to go to participants, and I am going to mute all. OK, and then just unmute as necessary. So this is another workshop. The, the workshop I did with Margaret in Florida earlier this year was really strictly um, an abstract workshop. This is a different one. This is something a little bit different where I'm trying to abstract the landscape. I have to tell you, it's not easy for me. It's simple, but it's not easy. And instead of trying to just turn it, flip a switch and go from one direction to a whole nother one, what I'm gonna do is take my three-day workshop in two hours, try to condense it and show you what it is that I'm trying to do and trying to share with everyone and say where we're going. So the first thing is, Hold on. We're gonna give ourselves permission. Now, I don't know where these little green marks came from, so forgive me. 
we are going to change the composition of a photo. As we all know, when we paint, paint plein air, you don't paint everything. If you're out there to study, you can paint everything as you see it. But if you want to paint a painting, you need to move things around. You need to eliminate a whole bunch of stuff. You need to change things. We're going to give ourselves permission to change the color to what suits us, what expresses our emotions. And we're going to try to do this in a logical sequence by altering the palette. I'd like you to feel free to change the light source to give your paintings a glow. That's one of the things that I've been trying to work on myself is almost like having a light bulb inside the painting glowing outwards on the objects that are surrounding it. Learn what doesn't work, even if it means failing. Remember, there are no failures, just more information. We're going to try new techniques. You know, I don't know how far we get in about two hours, but we're going to give it a try. If we make mud, at least we know what makes mud. Usually, making mud has to do with using inconsistent values, where you have something dark down and you put a whole bunch of light over it, or vice versa. A lot of times, if they get blended, that becomes muddy. And we're going to get out of our comfort zone. This, you're going to watch it and not get uncomfortable. I'm going to be doing it, and I'm, I'm going to be getting uncomfortable. But remember, if you're not getting uncomfortable, you're not doing it right, because that's how you make a change to something completely new. And hopefully, it's fun. So I'm going to be going from local color to glowing but I want to show you a sequence of events. This is what my backyard really looks like on a nice fall day. We're getting close to that point where we get those lovely fall colors. And then I do a no tan, always, always, always do a no tan. And I do a little value study on that no tan. This is all of two inches by three inches max. I have a very, very small notebook. I do a grise usually, and this is just a new pastel. And I almost always use UART 320, and I almost always mount it. I find it to be an easier texture surface to work with. For those of you that need to know how to mount something, I actually have a YouTube video on that on my channel. It's Laura Pollock Artist. You know, I'm not advertising it so I get likes, because this is not one of those things where I'll ever make money on it. It's just for people that want to know. And this was a local value type of painting. This is not quick. This is, you know, a thoughtful painting. But then I did some exercises where I thought, I'm going to take the same painting and I'm going to do some color swatches. I play with colors all the time. There are some great websites that you can use besides a color wheel. I'll show you that in a little bit. And I settle on a palette that I love. And I'll show you that in a little bit as well. So I do color exploration. So this is what it really looks like with local color. And then I start to go, hmm, I'm going to go a little bit wild. Oops, hold on. And then I go farther. And here are some of the steps that I take to get there. It's almost always about value. Value does the hard work. Color theory. Of course, I do the no tan that I just mentioned. I will, I'm not going to demo the grise today because I want to take it farther in the way of steps of what I do. Um, and I won't do a local color, but I will show you what the local color looks like, and then I will alter it. I'll do a little bit of complementary work on it. And here is a little bit about me and my progression, OK? I'm going to try really hard right now to get rid of those little green marks because they're driving me crazy, and I don't know why they're there. And now I've just done more. Hmm? OK, I'm going to just ignore them. So my progression, this is a plein air painting. I love going out plein air painting. And this is my backyard. 
and you know it's okay they're they're okay paintings but i could not find where my graphic design was because that's my background is i have an advertising and graphic design background and i really didn't see it in any of my paintings and then i started thinking about abstracts but to be honest with you i don't really like them i don't emotionally connect with anything like this i don't see a focal point i don't see a light source and even a Kandinsky, which of course he was very popular and, and this is uh, an extremely important piece. I don't emotionally react to this. I was asked to go to some abstract workshops and a friend of mine was holding them in South Carolina. And she says, come on, come on, you'll really like this. And it was with Jen Evanhus. And I said, I love her work, but I don't wanna paint abstracts. Well, this was my first abstract, and she had given us uh, a reference of just a curb, cracks in the sidewalk, bingo, I really loved doing that. Um, and then I went to a Deborah Stewart workshop. If you ever get a chance, she's absolutely an amazing teacher. And she had all these different formats of what we could be learning. So in three days, I did 13 paintings, and I absolutely went wild with it. I just loved it. I started to see some of the graphic design coming out. So what I did is I started entering shows with the abstracts and wow, they got in. What's interesting as well is that in North Carolina, we have a very well-known artist named Judith Cutler, who's an abstract artist. And she was one of the jurors for the PSA show a few years ago. And she came to talk to us in Greensboro when I was president of the association. And she started talking about the fact that they were lamenting that there are so few abstract entries. She and Richard McKinley were jurying the show and I'm going, hmm, maybe there's something to this. So I started playing with drama and light. As you know, I really love bold, bright colors. And these have gotten into shows. And I thought, okay, so some there's a door opening here. And I, you know, I'll just play like there's a big light bulb in the middle of it and it's just glowing. So some of my favorite artists are very traditional artists like, I bet you guys have never heard of this guy. His name is Bill Cohn. He is so amazing. He's an animator at Pixar and he will, I think he worked on Toy Story and he will be retiring soon I'm trying to get him to come to North Carolina to do a workshop because I'm in love with his work. And I would love to paint like him. I would love to paint like Liz Haywood Sullivan. I've taken two of her workshops. I just think she's amazing. Barbara Jenicky, uh was in Atlanta, just moved up to the Northwest. I also think she's an incredibly sensitive, brilliant artist. And Kim Lordier also took with her. Teresa Saya, look at her colors. Just the palette is astonishing. And of course, we all know Lina Celta and her works are astonishing, amazing, gorgeous, and Kung Wen. Um, I'll never paint like these people. They are so far ahead of me. And the question is, do I want to? Because there are so many landscape artists and like Kung Wen, a beautiful portrait artist. And I just, I figured I need my own voice. So I started looking at my favorite abstract artists. Take a look at this woman and she's not a pastelist. She's a multimedia person. Her name is Carol Nelson and I love her sense of color and texture and design. Of course, I mentioned Jen Evanhus who, I mean, who would ever do an aqua blue apple with green and red? God, it's just gorgeous. And her landscape on the right. Those colors, they just sing. As I mentioned, Deborah Stewart, look at the glorious colors that she will put together here. Really just fresh and wonderful. Of course, many of you know Tony Elaine and I'm enthralled with his work. It's very, very graphic, but it's still landscape. And a lot of it is almost realistic because he's still taking elements of reality, light and dark shadows and patterns. My philosophy on paintings is the following. 
it should be like a good work of fiction where you take elements of reality, mix it with your own imagination and let the viewer finish the story. Now, I don't know how many of you heard, have heard of Brian Rutenberg, but one time he was here in North Carolina uh, at a show in Charlotte. And Linus Selta says, I'm coming up, I wanna see his work. So we went to see his work in Charlotte. And before that, I looked at it and I said, I don't get it. I don't relate to it. I just didn't get it. But when I saw it in person, these paintings are 40 feet long by 15 feet tall and impasto and absolutely gorgeous. And look at his sense of color. And these are trees. These are all trees. So I wanted to start with that to tell you a little bit about some of my influences. But of course, we need to know about value. We all know, we've all heard, value does the work, color gets the glory. It's the backbone of entry painting. So to teach these workshops, I sort of had to go backwards in time and re reverse engineer a lot of this stuff so that I could explain it. Again, many of you already know this and sorry if it's, if it's too boring, but it's worth reiterating. Value is how light or dark something is on a scale from white to black. It's important to the success of a painting even more than your selection of color. This is my palette. I really love blue earth. So this is a full set you'll see on top. And all I did was take a picture of it and convert it to black and white. And the reason I love blue earth is because it's all set up for me in chroma and value. So if you watch my little cursor, if I need a mid value green, but I wanna go a little cooler to the aquas and then maybe even more to the blues, <laughs> it's like a crossword puzzle. It's four up and four over and over. Now they're square, so they're a lot like Terry Ludwig. Um, I have a full set of that as well, and I use them both. But when I travel, I use the Blue Earth um, and they're, they're just wonderful. They're absolutely terrific. So here's a little value scale. And we know that color translates in the value. And this is just a color wheel. So when we see a dark value like this dark purple, oops, over here, we need to understand that that's gonna go into the realm of the darkers. But what's interesting as well is if you ever think, if any of you play an instrument, someone once asked, what are the loudest sounds on a piano keyboard, for instance? And one would think it would be the bass, but it's not, it's the high keys. And how funny that we call high key paintings very light. They are, the brightest and the loudest. So you'll see a lot of my focal points have this yellow orange next to the deep dark purples like a Terry Ludwig eggplant. So let's look at what value and contrast does. This is a painting, I'm sure you're recognizing it, but I've taken out all the contrast. It's sort of blah and sort of boring. So now you know it's of course Monet's haystacks, with here it is with full contrast and here it is in full color and look at the drama and the gorgeousness of it but when you go back to the blah it just doesn't sing the way this one on the left does so value tells the story it has been said that you can actually recognize a person from a distance of across a football field on a sunny day by the way light creates shadows. For instance, the eyeball socket underneath the eyes, under the nose, under the upper lip, lower lip and chin. And that's what we're seeing here. We know exactly who this is and all it is is black and white. You don't need any color to know. So value is very, very important. Even as you go more abstract, you still need to know that. So, Again, I had to reverse engineer what was starting to come intuitively so that I could explain it 
to other people. So of course, this is the color wheel and here are showing the complements. But color is relative. When you pick up a piece from the Blue Earth box going, this is gonna be the perfect color. And then you put it on your painting that's already in progress. If you don't test it right on that spot, you don't really have a clue as to whether it's the right color or not. But when you put two colors together, you have something called simultaneous contrast, how they affect each other. And we're gonna see um, a sample of that. One color can change how another color is perceived when placed side by side. The colors don't change, but our eyes see them as different. Most intense is when two complementary colors are juxtaposed directly next to each other. So let's take a look at a sample of that. For example, red placed next to green. Here's a beautiful bright emerald green. Here's a bright red. Now watch what happens. I don't know about your eyes, but if I stare at that green box with the red on it, it's vibrating and my eyes are having a little bit of a trouble adjusting, but boy, it commands my attention. So let's look at some different color schemes. I personally end up almost all the time using a triadic color scheme. I didn't know what it was called until I started putting this workshop together. Um, and I had taken color theory in college, but God knows it was a long time ago. So a triadic color scheme uses three colors which are evenly placed around the color wheel. The resulting effect is a vibrant scheme, even in low saturation, even when the colors are dull. Generally a dominant color is selected and the two other colors are used as accents. I'm gonna show a very, I'll show this afterwards when I have full screen, but I have a great color wheel that Teresa Saya recommended. So if you get a chance, write this down www.sessions.edu forward slash color calculator. This is interactive, not on this show because this is a PowerPoint, but when you go to that uh, website, sessions.edu, you can choose a split complementary, a triadic, an analogous color scheme. All you have to do is take your cursor, pick your first color, you know, you hit clear all, pick your first color, and then you go, okay, where's the complement? Where's the analogous? Where's the split complementary? Where's my triadic? And it is so much fun to play with, and then you can play with the values as well. So here's another split complementary, and I'll use these colors a lot, but I'm almost always getting into the triadics. I just love those colors together. So again, what I'm gonna to try to do today is condense a three-day workshop into two hours. It's a ridiculous concept, but here it goes. From Homer to haiku, from the epic novel to the short, short poem. So this is a, uh, a path right down the street from my own home. And I wanted to pick something relatively simple but complex to see how much can you get rid of how much can you eliminate and still have it read trees and path? Maybe not even path, maybe just trees. So here's the local color and I'll show you that in a minute on the easel. Here's what I start to play with, with compliments, reversing it, but still note some of the values are still the same and there are still value differences between the dark and the lights. And then I'm reversing some of the values where the tree trunk was very dark and I'm totally changing the colors. Now you can see some of the triadic color schemes that I'm talking about right about there. Here I'm negative painting. In fact, this is a black board and I'm just painting not the trees, I'm painting whatever's around the trees. A lot of times I love to take a wiped down painting and see what emerges. Does this still read trees? Not really, but it's just an abstract. And I play quite a bit. I think I've done this painting about 40 times. And some of these are only two inches by three inches. Turn it into a night scene, get whimsical. I'm changing the mass, the color, even the shape. I'm outlining with black. And here's one of my favorites where 
does it still read like trees? Is it so abstract that it doesn't? And a little bit of negative painting up here, a little bit of trunk. Um, again, the question is, how much can I eliminate? Are these still trees? And then I love mark making and playing. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share and come back and I'm gonna ask you guys for any questions that you might have at this point before I go set up at my easel. Are you asleep out there? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Nothing? Not even a little sleep. <laughs> Nothing, no, nobody's sleeping. Okay, that's a good thing. answer one question about the gray spray. And someone that, had, that was someone a had a, I'm sorry, someone had a question about what is a grise. That is a great question, and I'll show you a sample of it in a second. A grise, it's a French word that means gray. Okay, so it's just a value study. Now, I was thinking I would do one here, but if I do one, then it means I won't get farther down the line for abstracting. However, I will show it to you when I do my grises, I usually do them with a new pastel on a natural UART, you know, not, not tinted. And then I will wash it down with alcohol. And I like alcohol simply because it dries faster. That's all, okay? I have a question. So, so who's um, talking? Who's talking? Lisa. Lisa who? Lisa Briscoe. Hi, Lisa Briscoe. Nice to meet kind you. Kind of in the dark. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I understand the color theory and color mixing and everything. Except yes. the, um, I think the thing that's the hardest for me, oops, yes. the thing that's the hardest for me um, is translating um, the value of a color, uh, like, like, like I know, like I have a, on this one to 10, I have a, I need like a four value. Right. It's finding which color is actually a four in value. Um, it's like I get distracted by the actual hue. And so yep. I didn't know if there were like any exercises to kind of train. There are my exercises I do in my workshop. Um, I don't have time to do it now, but it's really fun. I'll describe it to you so you could do it. Hold on, I'm gonna get a tool to show you first. Okay. This is an absolutely super duper tool. I'm gonna see if I can pin myself to make me big. There. So this thing is really cool. I'm gonna put it over my face. <laughs> Okay, so it takes everything and it turns it into sort of black and white, but with red. And it's called Picture Perfect 3-in-1 Plus Viewfinder. So what it has on here are the different shapes you might paint in. It has a grid system on it. Let me put something white behind it so you see it. See the grid? Okay, uh-huh. And then it has a grayscale. So this is a great tool. Well, it's got everything. Yeah, it's got everything. It has a ruler on the back and it's talking about measurements over here. So I would highly recommend it. I think it's the best thing for handling how to figure this out. And I'm gonna put this up over at my easel when I'm working. So you'll get to see what this does, so okay? Laura, Laura, if I can add something. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> I have the tool and I love it, especially outdoors. You should be aware that if you're looking at reds, because it's a red cellophane, yes. it doesn't show it <laughs> as well. So if you didn't get to uh, go to Jerry's and buy this or online, you can have a red cellophane or just a piece of it. And my studio is full of them. I yes. heard about blue cell phones. I don't know about that. Or you can take a photo with your cell phone, turn it to black and white and verify. And be aware Absolutely. that the sounds are a little high and they mess up the value scale. But that's you know, back to you. Yeah, so I, I'm sorry, this is Blake Zofel. Uh, it's called Picture Perfect Three in One. What was the rest? Um, three in One Plus Viewfinder. Thank you. Yep. And for those of you that need to know, this is being recorded. You will be able to 
access this afterwards. I will send it out because it's gonna to record to my computer. I'll send it out later. What I'm gonna start with, here's another tool for those of you that haven't used it. It's called the View Catcher. Let's see if I can get that right there, okay. And it's really cool, to, especially if you are going out plein air painting, you can change the, the shape and proportion of what you're looking at. You put it closer, farther. And what I do sometimes is I take a pencil and I'll put a tick mark on some of the side areas to decide where a tree is going out off my painting, where a line is coming in. Composition, again, would be a really in-depth part of a workshop because that's where the design part is, especially if you're trying to go abstract. One of the things that's critical is that you're, you're the entertainer. You are your own stage director. Um, I've even made a little PowerPoint, which I won't show here, but how stage directors spotlight their focal point. Their focal point is the prima ballerina, okay? They're not gonna do the corps de ballet in the background and put the spotlight there when the prima ballerina is dancing over here. So you are in charge of how you set that up. All things, whether blatantly or subtly, need to point to your focal point. And the other part is, um, I took a workshop with Susan Ogilvy, and she was very adamant about the golden mean. She was so adamant. She took the decimal point out, three, one, three, one, three, one, three. Okay, so the, the, the thirds, we've all heard about that. But she also talked about, if I have a distance from the top corner down to the third, I don't want that distance anywhere else on my outer edges for an entry or exit point. Now I'm gonna go up to my easel. I'm gonna switch screens in a second and then you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, hold on. It'll take about 10 to 15 seconds. So I'm just setting up my iPad right now. Hold on. And I'm gonna screen share to my easel. Okay, can you guys see my easel now? Is there anybody saying yes? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna show you a few of the tools that I use. This is a teeny, teeny, weeny little uh, notebook that I take and I do my little plein air sketches and so on, okay? So the other thing that I love to use, many of you do this already, they're called Tombow markers. And they come in three values. They come in all kinds of values, but the ones that I use are the N15, which is black, N55, which is a mid value gray, N75, okay? And they have two points on them. And the reason is so that you have a big paintbrush style um, tip and then a fine point. So here I am, I'm looking at my photograph and I'm gonna use this to get my general proportions. And believe it or not, I'm going to take my black nibbed marker and I'm gonna put this right up onto my paper. It's very simple. And you can see by the size of my hands how teeny weeny this is gonna be. Okay. 
And now I know that I have the same proportion. It's very simple. Always with the little tick marks at the third so that I can get my golden mean, my focal point in the sweet spot. And sometimes I will even take a point. This is my mid-tone, mid-value one. And I will put a dot right there and say, don't forget this. This is my business plan. This is where I'm going to go with this, OK? And I will look at the angles, and I will try to figure out which angles do I like and which do I want to eliminate. I'm going to eliminate this tree. I don't think I need it to tell my story. I do like this tree. I'll have to see how wide I want it. I do like this little sapling coming off, but I don't think this one helps my story. I'm asking those questions all the time. I see the top of this tree trunk going out. I don't think that helps my story, having it go straight off my painting. So I'm going to start by making some lines. Let's see what I can do right here. And I know that I'm gonna have a nice hard line for the highlight. And I'm looking at my angle and I'm gonna take it up there. So in order to stop this from going straight off, I'm gonna pretend that there's a nice big canopy because this is a straight line. I don't want a straight line right at the edge. This is where my focal point is gonna be. I'm gonna draw a nice line where that highlight goes. Here's the angle of my path. I'm gonna put that in have it come around this way just so it reads. I'm going to put a nice big set of branches pointing right at my focal point. OK. And then I'm going to have the shadows. I'm going to put, I'm going to put this line in right here. And now I'll put a few values in. But to save time, let me put another line in because that's an important line. OK, this is the shadow part. But what I want to do to save time is I've done this already. So I'm going to show you what it would look like. OK. And that's all it is. This is not a finished drawing. It's just a road map. It's going to help me. OK, again, so that I can get farther faster. This is like a cooking show where some things have already been done in advance so that I can progress and get farther down the line. So I was being asked about a grise. Here's a grise. And all this is, is a new pastel. That's a very, very dark new pastel. I'll hold it up in a second. It's one of these probably. And I just go in and I put the darks in but I'm not putting a lot of pastel down. It doesn't take a lot and it'll melt. The important part is to use a nylon brush, a soft nylon brush. The reason is if you use, let's say an old oil painting brush like this one, it will just take off the pastel. This will melt it in. I'm not fussy about the kind of alcohol that I use. Whatever's cheap, I put it into an old jar. And since I'm just using it mostly for grises, I don't even change it out. I don't care that much that it gets really dirty. So any questions so far about grise? Hi, Laura. This is Pam Cook. Hi, so, Pam. How are you? Hi. <laughs> hi. Uh, so you're using the same new pastel for the entire grise, just using it like very lightly in the lighter areas. Is that right? Yes, you're not using exactly. The exact exactly. same stick, huh? Okay. Exact same stick. It's just like doing a gray value pencil sketch. The exact yeah. same thing. You press harder, you press lighter. Okay. Uh, so and I have this... a question also. You would do the same thing if it were a cityscape? That's a good question. It depends what time of day, what what's in the cityscape. You know, 
I might, I might address it the same way I'm addressing this, where I'm trying a million different things to, to decide. I do a lot of studies. You know, if I told you that I step up to the easel and everything that I paint turns out, I would be such a liar. <laughs> it just, it doesn't happen. I have about a 10 to one ratio of what works and what doesn't. So I've painted this, like I've said, about 40 times. So what you're seeing here is the grise with local color. That's all I wanted to do with it. I wanted to understand what the local color is. So back to your question, I would try it on little bitty pieces. These are like six by eight and I have millions of them. Scraps of paper, this is about four by six and just do a bunch of studies. One of my favorite things now is um, a watercolor underpainting with local color, sometimes with um, pastels with complementary color, especially on a sunset sky. That's really fun to do a hot pink underpainting for a blue sky and let it show through. It's amazing. So you guys all saw the local color one. I'm gonna put up another one that was a local color, but I'm gonna start to paint over this with compliments. Uh, may I ask a question? Okay, it depends on who it is. Hi, it's Judy Leeds. Hi, Judy. Oh my God, I love your work. <laughs> oh, oh, I love yours. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> on that gorgeous piece. Oh, um, oh thank you. Um, what paper are you working on? I might've missed it because I came in a couple of minutes late. I have sort of gotten into a groove with UART 320, but okay. I just tried last week our Lux Archival. Ooh. Oh, I just got it. I just got that. <laughs> yummy, yummy. Okay. So and now- what do, you, what, do you, what do you, you tone it with, with pastel and then alcohol to get that tone in the back? Yes. Oh, okay. and- the other thing that I love to do, you'll see me do this in a, in a few minutes, but I love to tint it black. Oh, loved. And I have to say the, uh, the Lux Archival tinted black beautifully. Okay. Now I would probably compare that more to a 400 than a 320. That's, that's my, my guess. Okay, so moving on, I, since I only have limited time, I'm gonna go fast. Believe it or not, taking a green painting and starting to put red over it, if it's not too heavily done, should work. But I need to do a disclaimer. Fact of the matter is, is that when I get up here and I do these demos, I am not trying to show off how beautiful a painting I can do. I'm trying to give you options to get to a looser, more abstracted landscape. Nobody wakes up and says, I think I want to paint tighter today. You know, we all want to start to get our marks and get looser. So what I'm going to try to show you in this is different paths, different roads to getting to that. So I'm going to go fast and I'm going to go very loose and I'm going to do something really bizarre. What I like to do on these demos is show you a color. So I, wipe, I keep a paper towel in my hand. I wipe off before most strokes. I'm gonna take this magenta over that green and see what happens. And I absolutely love what happens when you do that. It just makes me very happy. Green and magenta, who would have thunk? And I'm gonna do the same thing with orange here. So what does abstract even mean? So again, I had to look up what it meant and it just means moving away from reality. So when you start to change colors like this, you're moving a little bit away from reality. One of the things that's important, I remember being at a workshop with Liz Haywood Sullivan. This was in 2012. And what, what amazed me was just listening, listening to what she was doing. She would use her hand standing at the easel and she would be like sewing. And it was almost like Morse code. It would be like a nice mark, a dot, a stripe or whatever. And I found it fascinating to listen 
to what she was doing. So next time you guys get up to the easel, listen to your mark making and see what happens. So I'm going to try and actually, I'm gonna do something weird. I don't, I don't know what the outcome is gonna be. I'm gonna make that tree more golden. I'm gonna start with something like this. And I'm gonna bring it around, still trying to create some volume around this way. And I'm gonna change the light source so that it's actually the tree itself might be emanating that light. So you see why I have to clean each stick off. Even my gloves make it dirty. So my light source is coming from the upper left, but I might try to make the light source right about here. And let's see some things that happen. Again, this is all an experiment. I haven't done this before. We'll see if any of it works. I'm pushing. Some of us don't even think to push. We're always pulling, making marks. And I'm gonna try a little bit of orange right here. So thinking outside the box, let's try a purpley, but again, value is important here. Let's purple and orange right together and a nice big stroke. And it's so much fun to see how purple and green works together. So I'm gonna to try to alter this as well. Maybe, what should I do? Maybe I should take it into some strange green and let's see what happens. One of the key things that you all have to get to is risk taking. It is so hard, you have a beautiful painting, you're going, oh, I don't wanna ruin it, I don't wanna ruin it. But sometimes you just get stuck and you go, oh, it's not working. I put them aside. I like to work on about six different paintings at the same time, because when I hit a wall, I don't know what to do with it. Same color, lighter value. Um, if you put it aside for a while, you'll know. It'll come to you. You'll wake up, you'll look at it with fresh eyes one day and you'll go, oh, that's what it needs. Okay. Let's do a little blue in the foreground. So what you've seen me do is take a local color painting and say, okay, let's do something different. Blue leaves. Let's go to some deep purple background. Do a little negative painting in there as well. Listening to the mark making and the strokes. Turning your wrist, your shoulder, your elbow. And let's see how we're doing with this. It's starting to be a little bit more fun. I'm gonna use a deep red. I don't know if this is gonna work. That's good, it's okay. And I'm gonna to go to a strange aqua blue on the dark side of the tree, almost as if it's picking up some of the reflected light. Laura, you're, you're varying the pressure that you're using from time to time. You yeah? bet, you bet, yes. Yeah, okay. Let's see, are you, hmm, I'm not sure you're seeing the bottom of this. Okay. 
All right. So that's one. Okay. Now I'm going to take it off. Are there any questions so far? These are not finished paintings. These are just giving me information. Okay. So, so Laura, it's Margaret. Um, so you said that you wanted to make it look like the glow was coming from the tree. To me, yeah. it kind of looked like the sunlight was just shining on the tree. Yeah, it does. It still does. Okay. I'm gonna get there on, the, on one of the next ones, I'm hoping. Again, okay. you got to remember, I'm doing studies in front of you. I okay. do not know whether they're going to work <laughs> or not. Okay. okay. So I really do take scrap pieces of paper and I really do color studies to see what do I like. And I love this right here from the highest value to the darkest. Okay. So I'm going to try to be going in that direction next. Okay. And to go next, what I will do is take one of my black panels and without having a panic attack, I will try to get this set up. Let's see. I want to make sure you see the whole thing. So I may have to adjust. I'm going to put my finger up and see. Okay, you're not seeing the whole thing. Let me readjust, hold on. Um, Laura, this is Blake again. Hi, Blake. Hi. At the top, the numbers aren't rolling. I don't know. No, I'm not, I'm, okay, that's my iPad and oh, okay. I'm, not, I'm not videotaping myself. Oh, but okay, cool. if you, I just, because well, you were talking about you were recording it, so I just wanted to. Yes, Okay. if so. you look, at your screen on for Zoom, it should be there should be somewhere on there a it does say video, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm gonna try to lock this and make it a little bit darker. There we go. How's your view so far? Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, I want to just make sure you're seeing the bottom of it. Yeah. Okay. So here's my next test. Let's see what we can pull off. I think we're missing the very bottom of your picture that you're working on. Okay, if you see my fingertip right there, Just that's the bottom. Oh, you okay. see that? Okay. Yep. Yeah. No, not yeah. seeing the bottom. I don't. I don't. Are see you it. seeing my fingertip? Just I, a bit of it. The edge. I of don't it. see it. That's yeah, the I edge of the it. painting right there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, nothing. Nothing major should ever be happening at that edge of the painting. <laughs> So one of the other things that I love to tell people is it's almost like a vignette. Everything that should be really important should start to fade out as you go to one of those edges. Nothing strong or exciting should be at one of those edges. Now I'm gonna use a gray-ish type of pastel so that you can see my setup. Normally I might even use vine charcoal, but you wouldn't be able to see it. So this is what I'm gonna be using just to do my thirds. I also love to do mark making studies. Again, I will take um, leftover pastels and, or excuse me, pastel paper. How many of you remember those wonderful toys that we used to have where you just lift the cellophane and it clears your drawing with a little wax paper. Yes, yes, yes. Well. I do, <laughs> they were wonderful. Yeah, well, I'm old enough to know, remember that stuff. So anyway. Um, Same generation. What, yeah, what's interesting is that you can do that with this paper. I literally took it to, uh, I took it outside and I brushed it off and I washed it down with alcohol. And um, you can use it over and over again. That's what I'm trying to get at while I'm doing this. Okay, hold on. Let's see. So does everybody understand why I cut, put um, foliage up here so that this didn't go off? 
Okay. Can about, you take uh, that? Elaine Denson, can I ask you a question yep. about washing down with alcohol? If you sure. haven't already mounted your um, surface, will it buckle? Yes, it will. Hold on, I'll get you a piece and show you what it looks like. Elaine, it's Anita. If you tape it down well, it should be fine without okay. with alcohol. Okay, thank you. And that's this, paper? That's which paper? This is what it looks like after running it under the sink. Right. Unmounted. This, I'm astonished, came completely clean after running it under the faucet. And, and I'm sorry, what kind of paper was that? This is UR320. Okay. It's almost always what I use, so. Thank you. Sure. So what I'm doing is, so from a design standpoint, I'm looking at scale, I'm looking at proportion. You can see right here, there is a portion right here. I measure that visually, okay? Anything that comes off my page, I want to know how big is this space compared to this space. I want there to be a difference. So I want to see this space and I want to make sure it's not exactly the same as that. And it almost is. So I might change it so it's a little bit different. I'm entertaining my viewer. I want to make sure that they have an engaging experience. Okay. Now I'm going to try to go into a completely different set of colors. Let me get one thing here. Okay. I am going to start with that color um, palette that I had chosen earlier that's a lot like this, okay? And I'm gonna try to stay with that triadic. And I'm gonna go with a nice deep purple tree trunk. And the reason is because I know right about here, I'm gonna be doing yellows and oranges. So I always ask of other artists on a scale from one to 10, how hard are you pressing? So right now I'm pressing at about a six or a seven because I, I would like it to go pretty a la prima. That means in one go. And I'm going to make right here, I'm still gonna have this be light coming from the left. And one of the reasons that I love working on black paper is take a look, this is UART untinted. I'm gonna take the same color that this is right here and look at the difference in the drama. Okay, so that's why I like to tint my own paper. The other reason I like to tint my own paper is I'm gonna show you a piece of UART, which I love, mind you but it's their paper, hold on, that's already mounted, but it's not nearly as dark as mine. And I have to just pull some tape off. Sorry for this delay. And it also, they don't have 320 in the um, UART dark. They only have 400. So I don't know if you'll be able to see the difference, but this is their black. This is my black. I want that versus that. And I love this, but I like the drama better that I can get with it. Okay. So I'm gonna go with that 
triadic color scheme. Laura, while, sorry to interrupt, it's Anita. Um, what are you using to tone the black? What a good question. And for those of you that want to know how to do that, <laughs> again, on my YouTube channel, I do exactly that. Um, I use, all of us remember our little color theory days where if you use a Prussian blue and a burnt sienna, you will get very, very dark darks, okay? However, if you take new pastels in your deepest, darkest blue, like I showed you earlier, a deep dark brown and then a deep dark green, and you just you know glaze over your painting and um, then wash it down, you should get a really nice dark. If you don't get it the first time around, keep do another layer. It's that simple. So you don't use like acrylic or watercolor? Nope. Acrylic, from my um, experience, clogs the, the pores, so to speak, of the, the grain. And I don't want to lose anything. Makes sense. So let's see. I'm going to take this lovely aqua blue, turning my pastel, making marks that are sort of fun. I'm not losing anything. If I make a mess on this, tomorrow I'll just take it, wipe it down, and I'll be done. I'll start again. So here's my little triadic here. Look at how fun that is. Look at these colors playing with each other. There was a question coming in. Yes, it's Elaine Denton again. When you wipe it off, do you use a brush or a yes. towel? Okay, nope. what kind of brush? See this nasty old brush? This yeah. used to be a nice long oil painting, hog's hair brush, but Thank the sandpaper you. eats it. So yeah, and do it outside. You don't want to be eating that dust. Mm -hmm. Laura? Yes? Adrian Giuliani, hi. Hello, my <laughs> friend, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing well, how are you? I'm, I'm having fun. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question. So um, do, you, do you use any, I think of the Terry Ludwig Intense Darks? Yes. I'm wondering how that would look on the on this toned paper? For um, tinting or for using? Uh, Here, no, this is a brand new Terry Ludwig eggplant. Okay. okay. Watch, you will be amazed. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. Cool. Do you see how dark that is? Darker. Yeah. Way darker. And yes, I do use it like down in there. It's amazing. So I'm gonna go to some browns, like this up here. Ah, uh, it just broke that one. I know, doesn't it make your heart hurt? <laughs> Sad. It is. Have you guys used Unison, anybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, but oh, not well. simply. I'm gonna get to try some soon, which will be nice. They are nice. They, they have a nice, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you'll like them. Oh, good. So here but I probably, am. Probably, yeah. probably not as much as Blue Earth. Oh, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do like these a lot. And look at the different kinds of marks you can make with a nice square-ish pastel. So let's see where I'm going with it. I'm gonna go to some darks on the outside here. It's a dark purple. And then I'll use some greens over it because green and purple make happy companions. And if you note, 
one of the things that I, um, I love to do is take a pastel, roll it on your paper. You can find the edge, push up and then pull and you get a really beautiful mark like that. And here, I just do it again. And now I have a tree trunk in there just by virtue of a little bit of negative painting there. Mm, and what's fun is to use same value, different color. This is a lighter value, but it's in the same color scheme, but it's a little bit lighter bluer. And so the reason I'm doing these types of exercises for you is to show you that we all need to experiment. We all need to take our risks and figure out how we're gonna make a different type of painting. I used to remember going to a workshop thinking I'm gonna come home and I'm gonna paint like Liz Haywood Sullivan. <laughs> well, uh-huh, yeah, good luck to me on that one. No, that just doesn't work that way. So you have to experiment, you have to play, you have to find out what works, just like Edison trying over and over again to make a light bulb. Um, it's Elaine Denton again, I have another question. So of if course. you decide that you're gonna make tree a tree um, blue, does that mean that you're gonna carry that over throughout the whole painting? I do like, that's a great question. I do like to have a color, if used here, used somewhere else, just for unity purposes and so on. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question the way you meant. So, so you're saying that you're really doing it more based on is, is it working as a total painting versus are the two objects that are in the same category, the same color? Yes, I am doing it for the total painting. I am stepping back all the time. Ooh, I like this. <laughs> I'm surprised. I step back all the time to evaluate and see what I'm getting. Thanks. And, and deciding, does it work? If it doesn't, then, you know, let's say I make a mark right about here and I don't like it. One of the things that's very simple to do is to take that nylon brush and just tap, tap, tap. And you will diminish the importance of that mark. And then I can go back with something else. And since this is my focal point, I'm gonna just go real bright right there. So Paula, I have a question, Michal Borkai. Hi. Hi, so you're working on thumbnails. Now you are going to the whatever size you decide to make the final painting. So are you able to maintain that color scheme or do you find yourself doing other things since so much of it is intuitive and uh, on the go? I, I can pretty much make it happen again. And would it work? Because sometimes smaller doesn't translate better to be bigger. That's a really good point. Um, you have to, and you all know this, you've all sensed it. You have to let the painting talk to you. You have to listen to it. If you're fighting it, then you gotta listen. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I'm putting red here is because I want it to reflect up. Remember my little light bulb that's on the inside of my painting? That's what I wanna have happen. Okay. So I wanted you to see this. Let's see the time, it's 3.30. I'm doing pretty good. Okay, any questions so far on this? Okay. Laura, yeah. kind of a this is Pam Cook again. Kind of a general Hi. question. Um, yes. Do you ever get uh, to a certain percentage, maybe not done, but maybe 75% done and decide that that composition wasn't working the way you wanted, so you start cropping parts of it off? It, it seems like what you've done is so well planned in the beginning. Uh, and I know I struggle with that. Well, for instance, I've seen Marla Baguetta start a painting this size of a big sheet, very small, okay? Yes. 
and she will leave all this paper outside of it. And I'm cringing going, oh my God, what a waste. But what she does is if it doesn't work with a crop here, she'll expand it an inch, then maybe two. Now you're asking, should I cut into something? Normally I don't because I'm sort of a miser on the paper. I really want to use the paper. I want to design it first. Uh -huh. um, the other thing is that I'm a lot of times painting to a frame. I'm over the idea of painting these lovely custom sizes and then spending three and four hundred dollars just to get the sucker framed. I'm not interested. Yeah. So I will I have almost settled entirely on 16 by 20s as my show size, so to speak, or my favorite painting size. These things I do for studies, but I also sell them. And because they're small, I can sell them easily. It's no big deal, okay? Yeah. Um, but I am very cognizant of my framing and I do all my own framing. I chop and join. I buy ready-made frames from a supplier. And wow. so, yeah. Okay. So here. Go ahead. No, that, thank you. That's good information. Thank you. Absolutely. Laura, and, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Margaret. I had, I had a question about the piece that you just took away. Yeah. It looked as though the trunk and your path with the focal point was more abstract colors, but what you had done where the, where the leaves are is, is towards local color. And yeah. I just, I found that interesting. So it's not, at least in this piece, and I don't know where would you, I mean, cause I know this isn't really finished. Where would you be going with this? Would you be taking away more of a local color or would you, and making it more imaginative or would you continue in this direction? Well, I think the answer is gonna come on this next one. Okay. Okay, I think. Okay. Again, I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm a know-it-all. I'm experimenting right. in front of your eyes. Right. I'm, it, I'm, anyway, yes. <laughs> so I'm going to try it again. I sometimes find like if I'm working with a compliment, like it works for part of it and then it doesn't work for part of it. And then it's like, okay, do I be consistent and go totally with a compliment? Like if you're getting to the sky, do I really want a yellow sky or whatever? Or... Um, or do you mix sort of realistic with not with less realistic? Yes, mix. Mix, okay. Thanks. I think then it becomes much more entertaining personally. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna do something a little bit bizarre here. I've been dreaming about this one. <laughs> uh, again, you're seeing it first here I've never done it before, so we'll see whether it works. I'm just going to play with really bizarro colors. And this is the path that I'm highly recommending that if you say you want to get more abstract, you play. This is I, I liken it to make the difference between making a U-turn versus a right turn off the exit ramp and trying to take a side street. Okay, so which is this, the U-turn or, or no. the side street? <laughs> no. This is the side street. This is the side street. All right, the second. But we're getting we're getting more to the crazies now. We're really getting more to the really crazies. I mean, it depends on how you define abstract. I have again a PowerPoint all about that. We don't have time for that on this, but in a three-day workshop, we, we talk about all that. And the fact is, is that it depends how you define it. 
it depends as you look here what's going to read tree what's going to read canopy what does it make a difference am i just trying to evoke an emotion Here's a fun one. Lorenzo Chavez, during one of his workshops at IAPS, which I love his work, um, said there's a rainbow in every painting. I'm thinking, oh my God, what is he talking about? Are we talking unicorns and rainbows or what? And he says, when we're talking about a rainbow in every painting, we're talking about what's up close are the reds, the oranges, the yellows. And as we move into an atmospheric distance, then we start to go into the blues and the purples. So I try to keep a lot of the principles of these things in mind as I go into this. So I am gonna pick up a piece of my beloved Terry Ludwig and I'm going to do some outlining here. This is the eggplant. And we'll get back to that in a minute. The only thing I don't like is this is almost the same shape. So we'll see if I can do something different there. And let's see. So one of the things I was saying in one of my PowerPoints is how much can we get rid of? How much can we eliminate and still have it evoke some type of emotional response to what we want? Like that Brian Rutenberg stuff, it's all about trees, but did it look like trees? Not necessarily. You can actually say a tree is any vertical line. So what's really fun, again, with the blue earth is that this is the same value, just a different color. Let's see how that goes on there. And that's something that's super important to become comfortable with. I know we were talking about the difficulties of it, but it is really important to be able to determine your values and be comfortable with them. So this time we do have this glowing look here and let's make our path be picking up some of that light. We'll start out this way. Let's see if that's about the right color as if the root of this tree is emanating the colors, the light, I mean. A lot of times too, you just, you paint just without even thinking. You see what happens when it's intuitive. And I start to get a little brighter as I get closer. Now, this is too level. I want it to be a little bit more interesting of a line. And I'm going to take it more into the yellows now. Let's see if this is, oh, it's going to be too dark of a value. See, it's going to just, ugh, looks greenish. For those of you that know Viana Subbo, um, she's always saying, <clears throat> we want a reddish or Sally Strand says it's some kind of yellow. Okay, let's see what else we can do. As this goes back in space, let's take it to a darker value still keeping a path. Um, 
let's see. I'm gonna go to an aqua on the back side. When you paint, it's nice to think about what the texture is, like you're running your hand over it. What would the tree trunk feel like? So remember, we I showed you that green and red thing. Look at the vibration that happens with this aqua and that wonderful red. So vary your strokes as much as you can. And let's see as I bring this around this way. I don't like that color that much. I don't like that one either. Let's see. And note, I'm trying to point my foliage towards that. So, Laura? Yes. Michal Bartai again. Hi. Looking at it building up. Yeah. What is your idea behind making that division in space between the, say, shall we say, the wild colors and the more realistic ones? Um, rephrase that. Let's see if well, I can. I think it out. has to do with Margaret, uh, Margaret's question before, because she noted that you were using one side of uh, not the color wheel, but your choices was a little more wilder, like you have here, uh, mm -hmm. reds and blues and whatever. And then you have some more realistic colors in the foliage. And right. you created that division between them, sort of half and half, shall we say, by using that uh, Terry Ludwig purple. Right. Uh, and so there's a, a large mass of Fantastic colors, and they're a large mass that come like yin and yang. Right now, it looks like yin and yang. Of yeah. Realistic colors. Was that your what you were trying to demonstrate? What gave you that idea to make that very strong line to divide the two? So almost all of the paintings that I have been coming up with that I haven't really thought about all that much consciously. If you look at them. There are, there's something realistic about even the strange ones that I'm doing. Um, for instance, the one that I just posted today, um, it got an award from the Pastel Society of New Hampshire. And it is totally abstract. It's just from my head, but it has elements of realism in it that are important because it draws you in and hold on one second, I'm trying to concentrate on this. By the way, I wanna show you a trick. I hardly ever use my fingers, but when I want a really smooth line, I just push and try to do that. So remember earlier when I said my philosophy about a painting is you combine um, fiction with reality and let the uh, viewer decide. That's sort of what this is about. Parts of it are real and they call you into it and parts of it are not. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to go, what is that? I don't understand. And try to decide with that. Did that answer it, Michal? Yes, I think so. Thanks. Okay. Okay, let's move my little clips. And I'm gonna take a little orange and almost as if this is an edge. That was a bad line. It's sort of reading like an Escher in color. Yeah. As a perspective is is um, confusing. It's like wh mm -hmm. which pl which plane is in front. Yep, yep. And again, yes. I'm yes. playing with realities or mixing them up. Okay. 
or it reads like a stage set with the arch being the, where the curtain right. would be coming down from. And I absolutely love the fact that you think it looks like that. So that's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you succeeded in your, your yeah. goal. Okay, so again, another study, another playful thing. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple mark making exercises and then I might, if I have time, do another one. So this is an old painting that it was probably one of these, okay? And I suggest highly that each of you tries to do these things. This is just some red. I'm gonna do that rocking thing that I talked about. I'm gonna to try to find an edge, push forward a little bit and pull. And I love the gradation. And then just see what can I do to get a different kind of mark. And trying to get different looks becomes your signature. And if you think it just happens, it doesn't. I think, I don't know about you, but I used to have to practice my own handwriting. Anybody know Christine Swan's logo? I mean, she's got the most beautiful logo and it's sort of like this and it's a swan. So you try to make different things happen. So I just wanted to show you that. One of the things that I just did as a demo the other day was instead of making a swipe like this, which is nice, I did a swipe like this, pushing it. And I found it to be much prettier. My, using my arm in this direction, shoulder rotation seemed to be much more um, effective than this. I should have done that on the other painting. That's a fun one for grasses and so on and for an edge. So I just wanted you to see that. Let's see if I can get one more in before we go to questions. Let's see. Oh, am I keeping you awake? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did that one time in art history class in college. And the TA looked at me and says, really? Am I keeping you awake? And I was so embarrassed. It was so funny. Okay. Let's just do something that is really minimalistic. Okay, so I'm not even gonna draw. I'm just gonna do some trees and we're gonna see what makes a tree. And we're going to do a little bit of uh, negative painting as well. So I'm painting everything but the tree. And on each one of these, whether it's a failure or not, I learned something. So 
So I'm completely deviating from the original photo now. I'm really not even trying to do anything that resembles this. Guys, still with me out there? Yep, we're here. Yep. yep. Glad, glad to hear. I had to unmute myself. <laughs> Just so interesting to see where you're going to go with this because you start something and I think, oh, I think she's going to do so and so. And then it's like, no, that's not what she's going to do. Well, I'm fooling you because I have no idea where I'm going. Well, and that's I'm your just... imagination. That's why it's fun. It is fun. It is really fun. And I really, really recommend that all of you play and give this a complete try because it's in playtime. You, you've heard this with children. It's in playtime that they learn. Mm -hmm. Can I be heard? You can be heard. Hi, Laura. I'm, I'm sorry to throw off track, but this is Carol. Somehow I lost the picture. I can't see you at all, but I can see everybody else. And I don't know how to get you back. I have no idea what you're doing. Does anybody have any suggestions? Go to the bottom of your screen. Are you on a computer or an iPad? I'm on a computer, but there is nothing on the bottom of my screen. All those cute little icons, they're gone. So no Zoom icon at all? Nothing. <laughs> Carol, Carol, try looking to see if your Zoom popped behind other windows. That's what I was thinking too. We can see you and Talk to you. I don't have any other windows open except this big window that shows all the people. Hello, people. Could you log, log on again, maybe? Get off and log on? I tried that, and it just hangs me up. Um, you know you what? Seen? At the top right of your screen, there are three little bars. There's a single bar, a double bar, and then like squares. Check some of those. Can you see a small picture of Laura? Uh, no, I can only see her empty chair. Ah. I'm not gonna take up everybody's time, but I'm like devastated that I'm not seeing you, Laura, so. Oh. No, we will have the- Carol? You know, log out and then jump back in. That's the best advice. I will try advice. that and see what happens. Um, it doesn't even really show me where to log out at this point. Do you see I can leave the I can leave the meeting. I don't see you later. Press, Carol, do you press see the you? bottom of your screen. Carol, Carol it, if you have view options, if you press on view options on the little um, triangle pointing down, it should say side by side mode. Uh, it's at the top of my computer screen. What if you just I, tap the, the only things I get I have in one corner, it says hide thumbnail video. The next one says show active speaker video. The next one says show thumbnail video, show grid video. And then on the opposite side, there's a little thing with squares and it says share swap screen with video. Over your arrow on the top, but do you see the little green thing where it says you are viewing Laura Pollock's screen or you don't see that? I don't see it at all. I'm not going to hold everybody up. I'm going to log out and try to log back in. Okay. Good luck. Good luck.
Okay, questions? Well. Laura, I have a question. Can you hear me? It's Moselle Foreman. Hi, Moselle. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So as I'm looking at your painting, I see chroma, I see you, I see color temperature. But for the most part, as far as value, I don't see much of a, a difference in the values. Well, let's do a little test. Hold on. There isn't much on this one. Okay. But let's look. Are you seeing any value yeah. differences yeah. there? Uh -huh. So the reds and the oranges are my focal point area. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's working from as I stand back. It's not the best composition, but it's sort of fun. Mm, and again, what's interesting is what is what is abstract? What is, what is it we're trying to accomplish? And where do we want to take it? So I, a lot of times my abstracts are completely just shape oriented. They don't even take into account the landscape. I actually like this one. This one sort of glows a little bit. It's a little bit of an oddball thing, but I like it. Um, and when I talk to people, I'm going to, st um, sit down because I don't know that I want to do, oh, I, s you know what, on the screen, it doesn't even show this. I'm going to adjust the screen because the orange on my, hold on, the orange on my, um, painting is really vibrant. Yeah. Is that any better? It's not better. It's really like day glow vibrant. Hold on. I'm going to move it a little bit. It's not, it's, it's way more than this. It's more like that, but higher contrast. So you see how bright that orange is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a photograph of it. And I'll, when I send it out tonight, I will, you'll see how much different it is. Yeah, even the photograph isn't catching it. In, in some ways no. it seems, it's Margaret, in some ways it seemed brighter when you had less light on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the contrast was higher. So I'm going to take it back down yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, well, that looks brighter to me, actually. Yeah, that's that's a lot closer to what it really is. Okay. So anyway, <clears throat> like dancing lights. I can't remember how many have I done so far. <laughs> right? mm, no, no, I think it's four or four. five. I think this four is the five. fourth, maybe the fourth. Okay. So does anybody have any questions? I would love to chat with you about anything you want to talk about. Uh, so what happened? Go ahead. No, I was just thinking nobody has any questions. That must be really boring. <laughs> All very clear. <laughs> okay. um, when, when you do like your glowing rocks, Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so when you did do your glowing rocks, it feels more like it's glowing than the edge of the tree trunk. And I'm trying to figure out what's different from this than, say, from the the one that you showed that had the the jewel tone. I don't know what you called it, but like with little, little emeralds or something. Okay, I'm gonna share the screen again. I'm just trying and to. I'm gonna hold them up at one at a time. And then you'll tell me which one to stop on. So hold on a second. Okay. Okay, so this was the last one. Yeah. And I'm going to take it darker. Because that's more like what it is, but the I, I can't even begin to tell you that the orange is really day glow. 
on the painting. I'm going to move it. And is that from the um, Blue Earth set? These are all from Blue Earth, yeah. Okay. See if that, no, it doesn't do it. Okay, so there's that. Okay. Let me pick up. There was this. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Then there was this crazy piece with the arc. Yeah, that's okay. And where's the other one? Oh man, this one's ugly. This was, I think, the first one I did. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't like that. <laughs> Takes a while. So that was four. I mean, I have time to do another one if anybody has any requests, but. So, so my anyway. question. I'm thinking yeah. about like the things that you've done that are um, your geometric shapes or the things that you've done that look like they're um, jewels where the rocks are on fire. And, okay. And I'm just wondering if you, because the, these glow, but they didn't have that same intensity of feeling like they're on fire the way the others did. And I'm just trying to figure out what's different. Oh, about eight hours or 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm doing these paintings in 15 minutes so that I can get through them, if you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah, but um, I, there's something about the, the, the um, value differences, I think, that you were surrounding the um, surrounding things with. Like Keep in mind, please, as, as well, this is super important. What... Um, Zoom shows is so freaking different than what really is. I can't mm -hmm. begin to tell you how sad it is. And we're all as, you know, those Zoom teachers I was telling you about, we're all trying to figure out how to get better quality. I'm gonna try to show you a series here and Margaret, you may have seen some of these, but hold on. I'm gonna share my screen this time. Uh, okay, do you guys see a bunch of uh, paintings that says COVID 2020? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so these are all a series and these took days to do. Let's see oh, if sure. I can get this. So let's see. I remember when you posted that. Yeah. So again, I don't know whether you're seeing a real glow on that yellow, but it's really bright. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me see it here. So this one, the colors on this photograph are nowhere near what it looks like. Right. And that's not even the final, there's the final one. So random um, question, those, all those very narrow lines in this other yes, one. Yes. Oh, do yeah, it, do you okay. Use edge, do you use a straight edge for those? Or? You're gonna like this answer. Mm -hmm. Not everybody knows what it is. It's a 3D printing pen. Good God. It's extruded plastic. And it sits okay. on top of the painting. Interesting. And casts and casts a shadow. Yeah. Uh, Laura, can you say it again? What it is? The three D printing pen. Yes. Okay. They're thirty dollars on Amazon. <laughs> it takes a it takes a little while to learn how to use it. But it's this it's the same stuff that 3D printers are made of, but it's just a little pen. It's sort of like a glue gun and they are so freaking cool. Very Let me cool. see if, <laughs> no, that's not it. No, that's not it. Hold on. Let me stop the share and get what I want to up and then show you. Um, hold on. 
So you wanted to see more of the rocks. Is that what you're asking about? It was Margaret? just, yeah, it was just the, how to achieve that effect. And what oh, I see, the, and what I see is that you put something very dark next to your lightest light. Yeah, absolutely. So, That's exactly it. And the compliment, no less. So if you were doing a tree, like where the trees were, and you had the orange trunk, and then you had the yellow path, if you wanted to achieve that effect for the tree, you might put even a lighter, brighter orange right at the edge, and then a really deep purple skinny line. Okay, let me show you another one, but you're absolutely right. Something like that. I'm gonna show you something that I just finished a little while back. If it's orange, you do a bluey purple. Exactly, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so this is called internal navigation. And it, if you note, purple, orange, very mm -hmm. dark, very light. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm trying to accomplish with about two hours, not even, is to have you guys have an idea as to how to let go of preconceptions of a landscape, how to change a little bit of your thinking, how you have my permission and your own permission to change the palette from what you see, how you can eliminate whatever doesn't help the composition, how you get to reverse the lighting if you choose to, have the light come from the inside versus the out. You get to be the director of your own show. And that's, that's the direction. That's what needs to happen. And in fact, Margaret, as you look over my shoulder right there, Right. There's one of those paintings, okay? Yeah. Where it's very dark right there and the lightest light I can get. And it's a full range spectrum all the way down. Okay. Right. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So I'm really open to lots more questions. Let's get into gallery view. And I'm going to... I think I stopped my share. Okay, I don't need to share anymore. Oops, so, right. who else? What else? There's got to be more questions. Laura, it's Pam. Hi. I, hi. I don't have a question right now, but I have a um, a comment and a thank you. I mean, there's so, I've learned so much, and and you've given me so much to think about. But one thing I'm going to try to start doing immediately is mark making exercises before I start every painting because I find that sometimes in the middle of a painting I have kind of forgotten that my marks don't all have to be the same or something. I'm starting to make marks that are similar when I didn't intend to. And maybe those exercises will help me to remember. Absolutely, warm up. So there was one guy I took a workshop from this is a watercolor workshop when I was into watercolors many years ago. His name is Joseph Fettingus. He was very, very good. He sat there quietly, eyes closed, meditative state, deep breathing and said, you need to get into the right place. And then the other thing is when you get up to the easel, start moving your arm, your hand, your wrist, use it all. This is an amazing machine, okay? And if we just stand there and we do this, it is just little soldiers. Those marks will not just happen. You have to practice them. And the bigger you paint, the better you'll have that ability to get a nice swoop, okay? And find the, finding the edge of that pastel. I used to liken it to painting or playing the piano with a sledgehammer. I mean, we all had our paint brushes and if this was a paintbrush, we knew where the point was. We could see where it was gonna hit. When you have these pastels and they're big blocks, 
how the hell you know where it's going to hit? That's why I like to rock it to feel where it's going to go and then tip it. There are different ways to hold it. You can use your thumb and middle finger and then use your um, uh, index finger as a lever to create more pressure if you want to. Anybody that ever airbrushed will know that that's the way an airbrush works. You hold it like this and then you press down, push forward and back. It's very cool and it's definitely worth practicing and getting into it before you get there. The other thing is you can have an extra piece of paper to practice a specific mark. I had one painting where I was at the end. I was at the end and it worked just fine, but I wanted to, to, I wanted to put two marks on it. Um, I'll see if I can find it, but it was a huge risk because if I screwed it up, then it would ruin the painting. Let me see if I can find it. And it really, I thought it was brave on my part because like I said, it, it could go either way. This will take me a second to find, hold on one second. I think this is it. Nope, that's not it. And um, I had to practice those marks. They didn't just happen. They and the other thing that I wanted to tell you about that's really cool is let's say you have a wonderful painting and there are parts of it that are just terrific and you feel like exploring it further. Do another version where you've cropped in. Why not? I've done that and it's really pretty cool. I'm getting closer, so if you bear with me, I'll try to find it. This is not my main computer, and therefore the pieces are not labeled the same way as they are on my big computer. But I am getting closer. So if you have any questions in the meantime, by all means, ask. Hi, Laura. This is Jeanette Popper. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm here with my sister. She has paints too. Um, Hi. Anyway, my question is, do you spray any of your paintings afterwards or? During? Excellent question. Yes, I do. I spray them all, especially, especially if they're going to be shipped somewhere. Um, I had an experience and some of you have already heard this ad nauseum. So forgive me if you have. I got into Enduring Brilliance three years ago and I shipped the painting. And when I got there, I told my husband, I'm going, would you like to come along? It wasn't like, hey, let's plan a trip. It's I'm going if you wanna come along. <laughs> and he says, okay, fine. Anyway, hold on, I might have found the painting. Nope, I haven't found the painting yet. And when I got there, I walked through, I was so excited. I walked through the gallery looking for my painting and I couldn't find it. So I walked through again and I couldn't find it. Anyway, I finally found it on the third try and it had dusted so badly, so badly, I didn't recognize it. Oh. When Richard, when Richard McKinley did a walkthrough, he just walked straight past it. He didn't make any comment on my painting and I just wanted to shrivel into the walls. When it got shipped home, I opened it up. Like I said, I do all my own framing. So I opened it and I dusted off the glass and it was black because I had used a lot of Terry Ludwig's eggplant. And I was a purist and I said, I'm not spraying it. And I thought, okay, Maybe I should rethink this. Then I did a painting that got into IAPS in Seattle. I shipped it off and I asked a friend to please let me know if it looked okay. And she says, it looked great. When it shipped back, the same thing happened. Got it back, it was black. I said, I can't do this anymore. So I, I smack my paintings vertically on a surface, let everything I can that can fall off. I smack it from the back. And then I take it outside, I lay it on the ground flat. I'm standing up, I use this. It's a cheap 
but archival fix. Marla Baguetta recommended it, so I took her word for it. It's about half the price of the other ones. And since many times when you use a fixative, half of it stays in the can when it clogs up and you can't use it anymore. I figured if it's gonna clog up and I'm gonna lose half of it, I might as well pay half. It does not discolor it. You stand over it almost at your full height and you let it mist down just in itty bitty droplets. And then it seems to work. It, I haven't had dusting since. The other thing is I no longer use UPS, I use FedEx. I have an air float box. I use the glass skin in case it's gonna crack or break, it won't hurt the painting. I do use spacers and I do not use mat boards anymore. The only time I use mats are on smaller paintings that need to feel a little more substantial. It needs a little more breathing room around the frame. May I ask, uh, it's Judy. It, do you, Hi, have you Judy. ever placed the, the, your paintings right up against the glass? On smaller ones, I do. I had Rita Kirkman here in my studio doing a workshop and I guess it's called Passe Part Out. Is that what it's called? Yes. When you, yeah. When, when you place the glass directly on it. And she told me of a tape that's archival called JLAR. And I do it on smaller paintings. Now, there are people that swear by it because it seals the package. Right. If you do it so that there's no opening, no space, there should be no reason that moisture or mold should start. I don't do it on the big paintings because a lot of times a big painting Again, 16 by 20, 24 by 30. If it sells, someone might want to reframe it. If they want to reframe it, then they have to take it out. I don't know that they would take the glass off of it, but it is an issue. So yeah. then when you get a slide, you can get some, some problems with it. But um, yeah, it's a very well-known technique. I can't say that I've had anything bad happen with it. And I'm just a little fearful to do it on the big paintings. I do it on my paintings now and I use that it's a I, I, it, um, it's used a uh, it's a silver tape. Oh it's could a you put silver. it put could you put the name of it in the chat please? Uh, well I don't I, let me go look for it. My framer has it um, has I got I got it for him and I have to go look at my in my tape. Uh, I'll go over and, and try to find it now and I use that just the way you said to seal it um yes. but you know the biggest picture i ha i i generally do are 18 by 24 i don't do huge pictures right so, uh, um and it's supposed to make it sealed the same way and to be honest um i have you know paintings up and sometimes i no i i can't say sometimes often if they're framed already, I've paid all the money and I'm sitting and looking at them. And after uh, six months, I see something I don't like. I have taken it apart. Have you had good luck with that? No problem. And then I bring it back to my framer and he has to put it back. <laughs> um, I take it apart and you know, cut the tape. I, I lift off the glass and I, I, I do it. And, and so I, I really, I haven't had a problem, but who knows? What kind of glass do you use? That's another good question. I don't feel that museum glass is merited in my work. If I was selling $40,000 paintings, then maybe yes, but that's not my price range. So I use uh, TrueView AR or Water White. They're both anti-reflective, not the frosty kind, but they're anti-reflective. They're, they're, they're cheaper. And I, I did see that the museum glass seems to have a tint to it of some sort. It does. Yeah. And I don't well, they, like that. So I'm, I'm going back, I'm going back to the true view, which doesn't have a tint. So up by you guys, there's a really good supplier called Omega. Do, do you guys use Omega? Never heard of them, but I'm writing it down. If you have a business account and a sales tax number, you can use them. Um, can and I make a comment? Sure. Well, I had an account with Omega 
and they when they changed hands a couple of years ago they kind of kicked me off because oh. i wasn't buying enough oh so i you know they may have changed since but you do have to fill out the paperwork and they want to give huh. you they want you to give them an idea of annual sales and amounts and it was a little you know daunting Wow. I was buying mostly my own stuff, but every now and then if someone asked me for something, you know, I could get them a case of museum glass or whatever, and I can't do it anymore. Well, I, I would keep trying. Yeah. I would keep trying. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't knocked me off yet, and I barely buy anything, so. But okay. they do have really nice chop join frames, mm -hmm. and um, it's actually worth it for me to buy from them versus for me to um, do my own. I mean, I'm looking at, I have about 20 10 foot sticks over at the other side of my studio that I could chop and join, but um, you know, styles change too. And I bought these big wide gold frames. Well, I'm not using that anymore. So being, especially being I'm going more contemporary. We all have those frames. <laughs> yeah. Are you getting frames? Um, are you getting frames from Omega also, or is that just glass? Yes. Okay. Yes, they do a beautiful job. If you pick out the molding, you give them the size, and you just say, "I would like uh, just a chop and join frame." I mean, I got a beautiful set of frames, like for fifty dollars each. You can't get it for that much from Jerry's. No. And they're just gorgeous. And here's the other thing. If you guys in your, I don't know how close you are uh, in vicinity to each other, but if you group together and place one big order mm -hmm. and then deliver to each other at a whatever or drop off, you've got it made. Now there's another one down here called International Molding, but they're not going to service you guys up there. Laura, can you tell us a little bit about your three-day workshop and what's involved? How that Absolutely. Plays, if people are interested. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of exercises. I break it down into small chunks so that it's doable. And we go through some of the same things that I did at the easel, but you're doing them. And what's extremely cool is I have the ability with my iPad to have you guys send me your paintings and I can work on them in an app called Procreate Live. And I can even send you a little, it's a very short little video showing the things that I would do and I can email it and send it back. So the three day workshop is, um, you saw the beginning of it today, but I have tons of handouts and I have eight books that are part of the workshop. So um, I email those with the recordings at the end of each day. And I have two different workshops. One is, you know, straightforward, abstract, getting the glow that Margaret took with me earlier this year. And then I had a lot of requests for abstracting the landscape so that we can loosen up from our tighter landscapes, which all of you are probably very good at, to um, taking it to a little bit more expressive. I really feel that there comes a point where once you've mastered the medium, when you know how to hold the pastel, you know your values and you know your colors, and that's part of what we work on, then you get to paint from the heart and you get to express what you really wanna be talking about. You wanna, you wanna share an idea you don't wanna share, here's a tree, here's a field. You want something more than that. You wanna show the movement and the emotion that happens. So that's part of what we talk about, how to take it to a higher level. Now, in reality, is three days enough for that? No, not at all. It takes a lot of hours. I don't wanna mislead anybody that after three days, you will be ready to rock and roll and win every show that you enter. I wish that was the case, but anyway. But it gives you the exercises and the tools, um, exercises starting with design, no tan, value studies, um, color studies, mark making, and going through the transition from a local 
color painting all the way through to some of the things that you saw me do, little and fast. And um, part of the exercises are, you know, 15 minute paintings or 25 stroke paintings, that type of thing. Things to get you moving because we all sit there and we do this, you know. And then three days later, we're still not done. So I don't have that patience. I need so, to, I need to move. So is, is it on Zoom the whole time? I know you told me yes. it's like 11 a.m. to 4 or 5 p.m. I forget. To 5 p.m. But there's an hour, there's an hour um, break because Zoom fatigue is real. And it's, it's mm -hmm. you have to take care of your eyes, your back, your body. Um, I expect people to get up and walk away. And there's a lot of, uh, I don't call them critiques because I don't know about you, but in college, that's where they ripped you a new one. It was really painful. So I call them art reviews. And we, we go over those things that are absolutely critical to the design and the values and you know even the mark making and how to do that. So yeah, I would love to have you guys in there. That would be I have fun. one more question. Where do you yes, buy Judith. your Blue Earth pastels from? Who do you buy? It Only from? Dakota. Oh. Only okay. Dakota. And they are on sale now, I think, for a whopping $950 for a full set. And to be honest with you, uh, I think a Terry Ludwig full set is like $2,500 to $2,800. So that's not a terrible price. Um, I have to say that I have used up a number of the colors, so I have to reorder. Right. But I have also been painting more than I ever have been, so that's why. And they, they sell it individually, Dakota, because I've been looking online and I couldn't find it. So you can order some individually to try it out first and then... Judy, yes. Judy, I have several of them. I did not buy the whole color uh, range. But I went initially for the pinks and purples, and then I expanded to some of the greens and yellow greens. I still did not buy the neutrals because I have other uh, uh, brands too. So you don't have to buy the whole thing all at once. Just wait for the monthly sale. And if Blue Earth is apparently now on sale, buy the ones that you think you'll need most. That's what I was thinking. You know, I mean, Ludwig, I don't have the full set, but I want, I have to get more of those darks. Definitely, I'm, I'm using them up like crazy. Yeah. I bought the yeah. um, Nomad set of Blue Earth. It's really a lovely, lovely set. And it's, it's a very it's, nice. It's what got, um, no, right now it's on sale for $169. It's 56 sticks and it's really nice for landscapes. And for traveling yep. in plein air. Which it's gonna like. end at the end of October. So, you know, to get it before the end of October, I think. And that's the what set? Mm. It's called the Nomad. 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 Oh, the nomad. nomad. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, I don't do a lot of landscapes, so I have to look at the colors of what I need. But, uh, but you know, it's good. I want to try the Blue Earth. I don't think, I don't think I have to look. I don't think I have any of them. So I figured out. You them. would know if you did. <laughs> They're really, really lovely. They're really wonderful. Yeah. You do well, need I, to have I, a light hand. You have to have a light hand with it. It's, yeah. They're very soft. I had a real quick question. Uh, I wasn't sure what chop and join is for frames. So you have a long stick of, of a piece of wood that's the molding, okay? Uh -huh. Chop and join means you cut it at the length like 16 by 20. You cut the, the, the um, angled wood to miter it. And then joining is when you put the two pieces together. So the company cuts it and then you put it together? No, nope, you can have, you could do it that way, but I would have them put it together and, and ship it to oh, you. Okay, so it's basically they're, custom they're, size. Yes, and they're right by you. And I have one more question is, um, I, ha I mostly work on pastel mat right now. I've tried, uh, and I have a couple of UART that I'm trying out, but do you have to mount it first or can you do your painting and then mount it later or do you mount it at all? So are you talking about UART or pastel mat or both? Both. Personal preference. There are a lot of people that never mount their paper in advance, but that means that you have to handle a painting once it's finished. And once you do that, 
you're either giving it to a framer to handle it, which I don't like, because one smudge, one scrape, and you've got right. a problem. Or you have to do something where you have to press it down onto another board, which means that you have to put something on top of it, like glassine, to, um, to press it down. Again, if you look at my YouTube channel, there is a YouTube video on exactly how to mount. How to mount, how to tint, and then uh, I do a whole painting as well. And, so, and even so, on how to brush it off, yeah. So really all the paper has to be mounted? Like That's I have to water water color and you don't have to mount watercolor no. really? But no, you have to mount. I like floating. I think floating is beautiful in watercolor, but Anyway, just a raise of hands. Who mounts, who likes to mount their paper first? Okay. Good. So I'm lazy. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't mount, uh, not because, I mean, I just, I just don't. So then I bring it, I, I have everything framed by my, my professional framer. And I don't know how he does it, but he, he takes the unmounted, uh, work and it looks great when he you know mounts it and frames it so and yeah. i have seen your work in the shows and it's gorgeous yes it's beautiful <laughs> but i'm i'm a control freak so i like to take care of all that stuff but you know when i was starting out um i started i guess about 10 years ago um and i thought you know if i have to go to my frame shop and spend three or four hundred dollars to frame with this you know, non-reflective glass with a custom frame, a custom size, um, custom size. I can't mark up my paintings enough to make it back and make any money, which is why I decided to do it myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I have a professional framer and there's a speck in it, am I going to run back and forth and say, look, there's a speck in it, take it apart, open it up. So that's why I do a lot of it myself. So just, you mount your own, you mount, do your own mounting too? I do. There's what, what a wonderful 3M product called uh, Positionable Adhesive. Again, just go, just go to the YouTube channel. It'll tell okay. you everything. It's very simple. And a That's lot cute. of professional artists are using this. I think Corey Pitkin, who's a great portrait artist, a whole bunch of them are, are using it. Uh, you have a yeah. Hi, Laura. This is Pat. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm um, good. I have a quick question about framing. Do you have yeah. a YouTube um, video on how you do your framing? You know, I don't yet. <laughs> I guess that must be the next one. <laughs> My sister and I, we are, are framing ourselves, but it's a, it's a big learning curve. Yes. Well, I, it's what it's, I do. What, what okay. I do is I have different stations in my studio. I have the space, I'm very lucky. I used to have the ad agency that you heard about and I have all these drafting tables. So I have three drafting tables and a conference room table. Oh. And I have different stations. I have a big Logan mat cutter. I'm sure you guys have heard of that. And what's interesting is you can actually cut your glass on a Logan mat cutter. And I do that, but to be honest with you, I've just decided more, recently that I'm going to settle in on the 16 by 20 and I buy my glass at 16 by 20. I used to buy 24 by 32 or 40 20, huge pieces of glass and I broke so much it was ridiculous. Um, I used to crack $30 pieces of glass all the time and I said no I'm not going to do that anymore. Anyway so you can cut your glass on your Logan mat cutter. Um, it holds it and you can pull it with just a glass cutter. Then um, I have the frame already done. I, either I've made it or I've bought it. And I have a table where I put down a bunch of uh, microfiber towels so that I'm not scraping it on a table. Put the frame face, face down, put the glass in. Then you buy spacers. Right. And you can get that also from Omega. Right. They're expensive. If you really don't want to do that, you can cut I mean, this is a lot of work, but you can cut little strips of mat board or foam core to the exact size and then use your 3M uh, tape to position it in there. But 
more times than not, it's going to slip and it's going to show and you'll be very mortified when they're in a show and that stuff is showing. Laura? Anyway, yeah. Laura, we need frame to wrap tech. up. Frame tech. They'll sell you one spacer or a hundred spacers and they're wow. delightful to work for. Um, Susan Ogilvy recommended them and you just pick up the phone and say, this is what I want. And Wonderful. they come in a long tube and... So I recommend that. Okay, it's it's Margaret again. We need to wrap this up, um, partly because about 10 people have left already. And I'm just interested, um, uh, if Laura doesn't mind if we do this, just with a show of hands or maybe the raise hand function, if people would be interested in a workshop with Laura, you know, we have nothing planned at the moment, but we're just kind of interested in, you know, if people would be interested. It would be a three-day workshop. And <laughs> I can see several of them. Uh, hands okay, up. see, I'm, you know what, do you know how to use the, the raise hand? Go to, go to the, your three dot thing yeah. where it says chat and other things and there's raised hand. That's the reaction. Laura, just don't forget to bring the uh, control back to us before you, if you decide to uh, exit. Yeah. You know, know what? I don't, hmm. I don't know how it's going to work for the recording then. Oh, maybe. May, uh, mm, but stop it's recording because we don't need the thumbs up. Will, thumbs up will work if there's a thumbs up. Do you? If your thumb, why is it showing on my? Oh yeah, it is showing. Um, or do the thumbs up if you can't do the raise hand. I'm I'm not sure who can see that because I don't see the raise hands. But anyway, if you we'll be sending out an email anyway. But I'm just. Okay. Trying Curious. I see one, two. It comes up. and goes is what's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what happened. Okay. But I was just, you know, just kind of, you know, curious because we would do it and we would, you know, have to, board has to agree on whatever the price is going to be and all that. But okay. And it would be I just want to, I just want to shout out to Deborah, Deborah Half. Yeah. Hi, Deborah. Okay. I'm going to um, stop the recording. Okay.